uh, Ben Ben uh, Yaakov Do. Yeah, all right. So the learning should be in Aliyah from the Neshama. Thank we you. should bring it. To bring it, his memory should bring us all together for meaningful Agreed. things like learning Torah and growing together. And thank you for sponsoring and facilitating this class. You're very welcome. Very well. Let's All right, now I'm going to pass it on to Jeremy and we'll jump right in. Take it away, Jeremy. Amazing. Hi, everybody. It's good to be Hi. here. Hi, um, good to see you all again. So I'm just adding that down. Um, all the learning that we, that we do tonight and all of the, the tefillah that should hopefully come from it should be Leilu Nishmat Aaron Akoin Ben Yaakov Dov. I think I got that right. Um, this is Neshama Shev and Aliyah. And... Um, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Um, and of course, also good Chodesh, everybody. It's good to see you all again. Um, just like last time, I think the best way to start off might be with the song. Then we'll do uh, a much shorter go around. We already know each other, so we don't have to spend as much time on it this time. Um, and then we'll get into stuff for tonight. So um, I guess I'll just um, ask everybody to throw themselves on mute while I'm well, I'll, I'll sing and you can sing along in the comfort of your home just because otherwise no one can hear anybody once we start to do the singing part. Uh, so, yeah, I guess I'll start us off. Bilvavi mishkanevne le'adarkevodo Ule mishkan mizbeach is a, a pretty serious musician so uh you'll have to tell her that i hit the high note that time she won't believe you <laughs> but uh you'll have to let her know um just to start us off like i said it is really good to see everybody again um i just do want to give us a chance again last time we had a much longer introduction but just quickly to get a chance to just go around um just tell us tonight i don't know how, how you all have been feeling but for me, like sometimes being in quarantine, I just lose all kind of concept of time. My wife and I, yesterday, we were working from home. We looked up and we were like, is it five already? And then I, I looked up again and then I was like, is it 11 already? Like the time just keeps keeps on going. So just to give us, um, you know, just to, just to let us know quickly kind of what time is it for you right now? You know, based on whatever you're kind of feeling, your, your internal clock, what time are you at right now? Uh, I could say for me, I'm probably more at like a, a 5.30, kind of that feeling when like, you know, you just finished with uh, whatever you were doing for the day and I'm still a little bit in that transition out. So that's where I'll put it at for me. Uh, I think it worked last time for me to just kind of call people out. So maybe I'll just do that. Um, Richard, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, so, you know, um, I'm an artist and a writer. So I normally spend a lot of time by myself. Um, and uh, so today is no different. And quite frankly, uh, this is why, you know, you get a little crazy because I understand um, not only, you know, we've got this pandemic going and, but also 
the world is going to hell in a handbasket, if you'll pardon the expression. I mean, we just impeached a president twice. Uh, it's hard to ignore those things. Um, and I, I keep on trying not to look at the news, but it's, it's hard. Um, but I'm deeply involved in a, a new project. Um, I'm starting a, an essay that I hope will be published in Mosaic magazine about uh, some incredibly stunning Torah shields uh, that were sold a month ago uh, that, are, that are major, major works of art. So, um, you know, I'm kind of ignoring the world. And I know it's, 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 it's 713 for me. <laughs> I'm right, and but, but once we get off of this, I'm going to learn with my Harusa, the, the daf, and back to work. So that's me. amazing. Away from the world, but also in the present. I love it very much. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll throw it over to to Kressel. What what time is it for you? Where are you at? Uh, to me, it feels close to bedtime um, because I. I go to Muncie periodically to see my husband and kids, and today was the day. So I, traveling, it's the most traveling I do really now to go from Muncie here, and I do it by public transportation, so it takes a long time. So I'm doing what this year, and then after that, <laughs> probably not much, much else. Straight to bed, so near bedtime. Good. <laughs> um, maybe I'll throw it over to uh, Risa. Just make sure to unmute so we can hear. To me, it's like really early in the morning because after work, when I know I have a Zoom class, I try to take a nap ahead of time so I don't get, you know, so that I'm able to stay up for the class. So. I, I woke up at a quarter to seven and it's early in the morning for me. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Um, maybe I'll send it over now to uh, to Margie. Are you, are you with us on the... Yeah, yeah I'm here. Um, well, I wake up between 4.30 and 5 most mornings because I like to go out... Uh, bird watching very early. And um, so for me, it's probably feels like about midnight right now. <laughs> and I'm like Risa, I try to take a nap so I can be somewhat alert for the class. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. It's all relative really, I suppose. Yeah. Um, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll pass it to Jeff also. Uh, I'm gonna pass, <laughs> give everyone else an opportunity. <laughs> Amazing. Um, Joel? I, I, well, first of all, I want to thank you for that song that really, really affected me. I, I remember, I think when it came out, I must have been in, yeah, seventh grade. And I remember a group called the Rabbi Sons, and it really got to me. It was, uh, I think, like many people in this country, or many people on the planet Earth, it's time is very confused. And just before class, one of my best friends, he talked about his 90 year old. Uh, uncle who just passed away from COVID and and uh, then I turn on the TV but I, I had a minute and just seeing everything you know I'm, I've been here on a work visa for many years I'm not American and it's like I wonder what I'm doing in this country lately but it, it it's very confusing it's very but the song just it really helped so it feels like midnight but it the song helped tremendously thank you bring us back in time a little earlier in the day Amazing. And I think, I think that just leaves Paul and Ellen. Well, it uh, feels like the end of a work day and we usually eat early. So it feels sort of like by 36 o'clock, uh, which is when we normally eat. But uh, it's been a busy day. Um, I did also enjoy the uh, gun that you use, which, which um, the Shira Hadasha uses for um, their Musaf um, Kedusha. So uh, it's, very, it's a beautiful tune. So thank you. Okay, and I'll say it definitely feels like it's after dinner. I have a nice full belly. I'm knitting. I'm relaxed. I'm calm. And I'm really ready to study with you. Glad. I'm glad. Hey, Jeremy. So I'm also Jeremy. 
but uh, we're just quickly going around to get started, just um, saying what, what time of the day it is for us, our internal clock. So for me, I was like a 5.30 right after work kind of feeling, still transitioning out. Is it you're asking me? Yeah, you, you joined, <laughs> um, you're, you're the last firstly, person to go. Firstly, I so. just wanna say the end and my last name is Newberger. Uh, oh, amazing. I'm Noam's dad. Yeah, I think we know each other. Good to yeah. see you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, uh, so my body clock is right now. Yeah, it's, I don't know, it feels like it's been a long day. So it probably feels about a, a little bit later than what the, the time might say. It feels like 830 or something like that. Amazing. Good to see you. Um, and then I guess, obviously, last but not least, I'll throw it over to Liat also. I'm feeling like uh, 9 or 10 p.m., I'd say. Not quite bedtime, but very tired. Long day. Amazing. So so good. So I think we're ready to kind of just jump right in. I'm just going to have to activate the old screen share function, and then we'll be ready. Perfect. OK, so screen share. I think if I click that. Should all be on the same page. You all are seeing it now? Yeah? Good. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So <clears throat> this is what I got cooked up for us a little bit tonight. Um, a lot of what uh, we focused on last time was this idea of, of what it means to enter, right? We wrote our, um, we had a chance to write our own kind of cover note of how we enter into things, talked a little bit about entering the different dynamics of it, um, and did some really beautiful sharing actually that I really, really loved. Um, so for tonight, I figured, uh, you know, once what comes after, uh, preparing to enter is actually going inside. What does it actually mean to be inside? And so that is going to be a, a big theme for what I want to talk about tonight. Um, I have again prepared for us after we go through a few Makoros, this time there's a little bit more than before. Then I do have an activity, uh, planned for us again, something that can hopefully bring us really into the text, uh, in a little bit of a deeper way. So. Um, I want to start with this, this forno here. It's kind of first little quote from Breshid. Um, there's a pasuk, right, when it's describing the, the birth and kind of the, the growing up of Esav and Yaakov, right? We have this idea that there were two adolescents. On the one hand, we have Esav. Esav became a skillful hunter, a man of the field. And Yaakov was a simple man who sat in tents. So none of them before should pick up on this idea, right? It says Yaakov sat in tents, plural, what that means sitting in all these tents. Um, one of the classic ideas kind of that I've heard before is that, you know, he was like basically Yeshiva Bachar, he was sitting in the tents of Torah. Um, Sforno takes it in actually a little bit of a different direction, which I, I found actually really fascinating. He says, there are two types of tents. One is the tent of the shepherd and the, right, and the other where he did not tend flocks. So he has two tents, so it seems like next to each other, right? One where he's a shepherd and one where he does not tend the flocks. What does he do in this other tent in which Yaakov reflected in order to know his creator and be sanctified in God's glory. So, right, there are these two tents next to each other, or that's how I imagine them. It doesn't necessarily say they're next to each other, but there's the physical tent and there's the spiritual tent. The physical tent is devoted to his physical state, to the things to upkeep his body, right? It's where he does his sheep herding. That's how he makes his money and makes his living. Um, and then there's the spiritual tent, which is purely devoted to what he writes here, right? Knowing his creator and being sanctified in that creator's glory. Um, we see this kind of dichotomy of the different two tents also in, in uh, later points in the Torah, right? Um, Bilam gets up and he says, Matavu Alecha Yaakov, right? The literal tents that Bnei Israel lives in are called Oalim, but also, of course, the Oal Moed, right? A tent that we think of as a, centered on our spiritual kind of well being. So we have this kind of dichotomous idea of this, the physical and the spiritual tent in, the, in these other kind of texts. Uh, what I hope we can do tonight is kind of get a little bit more into this idea of what does it mean to have a physical and a spiritual tent? Um, what is the kind of work that Yaakov is doing here? I find it very fascinating that the Sforno is very vague. It just says it's a place where he's right. It was a place of reflection and thereby sanctification for him. Um, but it's very nondescript. I mean, what activity necessarily comes with that? Is he sitting silently? Is he reading something? Is he praying? Is, who knows? Uh, Hopefully we'll get, we'll get to look at a few different options tonight, actually. So hopefully by the end, we'll know. Um, but, but that's basically where I wanna go with us tonight. Hopefully we'll be able to leave our physical tents 
at least in a spiritual sense and find those spiritual layers in our own tents. The first kind of option for what I wanna, wanna look at is from the Shari Tzion. The Shari Tzion is uh, you know, Rav David tu Tuvale of, uh, of Posen. He was like a 16th century kind of Musser, uh, Musser Nikon preacher. So this is what he writes about the idea of reflection and the idea of this hit boninut, right? He says, really what it all comes down to is this idea of menucha versus avodah, of rest versus work. Um, and this is exactly what he describes. He says, the essence of menucha ta nefesh, right? That feeling of, of soul rest, you could say, can be learned from the concept of resting one's body. Bodily rest is the transition from a state of bodily work to a state of rest, right? So what is the state of rest? It's the, the opposite of the state of work. When I've transitioned out of my work, I'm in the state of rest. So too, we must assume that there is a state of soul work. And from this, we translate, we transition to menuchata nefesh. There's avodata nefesh and there's menuchata nefesh. What then is this soul work, which is undesirable and which we are attempting to get out of in order to come to a state of menuchata nefesh? In Misi Lej Sharim, it says that one of the Yitzhara's strategies and its craftiness is to pile work onto a person's heart. The soul is always working and the attributes, the yearnings, the desires are felt constantly and create continuous thoughts and distractions in a person's mind. Person's affairs in all their forms, business affairs, family affairs, are also continuously occupying a person's soul. All of these thoughts and distractions act in an unordered way, causing confusion which cannot be overcome by common sense. A result of the situation is that a person is not, situ is not suited for reflection due to these feelings and distractions. Uh, you can't really lead anything in this time period without at some point kind of you know, addressing the whole like situation with COVID more or less directly. I don't know if other people have been feeling this way at some points in their life right now that like, it could just be hard to escape, uh, you know, at least the things that are distracting me and kind of worrying me. It's always kind of in the back of my mind. I noticed since last Wednesday, I'm just having a lot more trouble focusing in general, just on, on generally anything. Um, you know, there's a state where even if we aren't necessarily always having something in the front of our mind, it could be something in the back of our mind that's kind of chipping away at our ability to be intentional at our ability to be present, um, our ability to feel menucha, to feel like we're at rest, um, right? And so he says, he says, in this state, a result of the situation is that a person is not suited for reflection due to these feelings and distractions. Sensible reflection is not possible when there are such distractions. So that's avodata nefesh. That's when your soul is basically at work. And so what's the opposite? Menuchata nefesh. He says, menuchata nefesh stops all of these distractions and feelings and brings about rest from this soul work allowing one to fully focus on quiet reflection. This is, I think, really the most important point where we see why Yaakov was doing this. We under I understand that Yaakov would have two tents, but why would it occur to him that he needs this tent just for reflection? So I think this is really the crux of, of where it gets to that for me. Shari Tzion says, reflection is the first condition for all of a person's work, all of their avoda, from the first attribute of caution through to holiness and Ruach HaKodesh. Those are all the attributes that Misilat Yisharim is based off of, right? All of them, at the very basis of them, is hit boninut, is this ability for reflection. And this is why the Misli Asherim demands already when discussing caution, the very first one, that a person must free themselves from the labor of this Yetzer and reflect on the essence of good and bad, on their actions and path, if they are rooted in the good or in the bad. Reflection is the foundation of a person's ascent, of their aliyah, their ability to go up. And so how can a person not feel shame? This is where he really gets here. How can a person not feel shame when praying that God grant us knowledge and understanding? or whatever you say, if we don't work at all to reflect. Right? We say God is the one who gives us this knowledge and understanding. He says, how can a person say this honestly if they don't use those faculties to reflect on where they're going, on rooting that back in Kedusha? So uh, to me, this is really just a very kind of like beautiful uh, passage about the capacity for for hit bonenut, for menuchat nefesh, right? Thinking again about, um, about Yaakov's tense, right, is two tents. We can say there's this, this same dichotomy in this also, right? It says there's the state of avodata nefesh and the need to transition to, I'm sorry, in, of avodata guf and the need to transition into avodata uh, minuchata guf, that sometimes our bodies are at work and we need a place where we can put our bodies at rest. So he says in the same way for your soul, you need, a, you need also a place where you can take yourself, go from that place of soul work and go to that place of minuchata nefesh. This is one of the potential uh, ways that we can understand heat bon, uh, this heat bonenut, and also that we can kind of read this kind of physical, spiritual model. Um, but it's not the only thing, right? Here, we kind of have this idea of quiet meditation, 
reflecting back on your paths. Um, you know, the way that other Muslim writers talk about it, you really are just sitting and just reflecting and sometimes writing, but really you're totally focused inward on you and what's happening inside of you, on your actions, on your, your kind of past history. Um, but, but there are other models that I, that I also want to take a look at. And um, by the end, they might not be so different, but we'll see, we'll get there. Um, in the Gemara and Brachos, right, we have this, this amazing passage. This is something that I actually come back to a lot. My wife and I were looking at it together last week. We have this passage about David Melech, right? So in the, in the Tanakh, uh, there are these different characters who are interacting with God around the time of, of Chatzot, right? Late in the night, midnight. David Melech is listed as one. Moshe Rabbeinu is listed as one, right? So the, uh, the context for this is, is there's this kind of discussion about, you know, who can know this exact moment. They're living in a time before clocks. You know, they can't just look at the watch, say it's exactly Chatzot. Um, even if they can calculate it, maybe mathematically, they don't necessarily have some kind of clock that's going to tell them exactly. So um, this, this sugya is coming off the heels of basically the Gemara stating, even though Moshe might not have known exactly when it was midnight, somehow David and Melech would have known. So the Gemara is surprised by this. How could David have known? Moshe Rabbeinu is the highest prophet we have. How could David and Melech have known this kind of divine secret at the exact moment of midnight that even Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't privy to? So what's the answer that the Gemara gives us? It says, David had a sign that it was midnight, almost an alarm clock, right? Rav Acha Barbizna said that Rav Shimon Hasida said, a lyre, uh, right, a stringed instrument, hung over David's bed. And once midnight arrived, the northern wind would come and cause the lyre to play on its own. You have to imagine, right, on our alarm clock, I have to be the one who sets it. Here, I mean, it's, it's nature, it's God who's setting this alarm clock for David, right? David would immediately rise and study Torah until the first rays of dawn. At dawn, the sages entered and said to him, our master, the king, your nation requires sustenance. He said, go and sustain one another. They responded, a single handful of food does not satisfy a lion, and a pit is not fulfilled merely from the rain that falls into its mouth, meaning there's not enough of what they have to go around. We need some other source of it. He says, go and take up arms with the troops. If you need to go get it from somewhere else, go get it from somewhere else. Have a lot of fun. Uh, when, I, when I read this passage, honestly, I, I, this might not be the... the uh, Pashat, but it's hard for me not to hear a little bit of disdain in David Melech's voice for this job. I mean, it doesn't say that David gets up. It doesn't say that he opens the door for the sages. It doesn't even say that he looks at them. They just kind of come and uh, kind of barge right in and, you know, basically say, hey, we got to do some stuff. You, the nation needs to eat. And, and what does he respond? So they should eat, right? It's hard for me to imagine him even looking up from his Torah study, his Sefer or something like that, just based on the way it's written. Right? And so the sages kind of prod him. They're like, well, you know, and they don't say it in a direct way, kind of a roundabout way, almost as if, you know, they're even uncomfortable a little bit, but they're saying, you know, well, it might not, it might not be a good, they might not have enough of them on their own. You know, if you had only a little bit of food, a lion wouldn't be pleased. And so finally he says, okay, go, go, go to war. That's basically what he says, right? Um, if in the previous image, we had this idea of Yaakov's two tents, the physical and spiritual as two physical locations, right? demarcated more by space. To me here, what I see a little bit is, is two different, the same space, but demarcated by different times, right? What is David's way that he is able to basically escape his physical requirements, being the king, making sure everybody is fed in his kingdom? He doesn't go to a different place, but he goes to a different time. He waits till Chatzot, the middle of the night, and you know he kind of gets the alley-oop from God on this, but right, he has his own time where he's only focused on his spiritual growth only focused on his Torah study. And it, in, a, in a sense, it seems almost like it might be hard for him to be kind of drawn out of that. Um, right, so here in, in kind of contrast from the Shari Tzion, from this idea that, you know, the hit bonenut, the reflection that we do is more focused inwardly on what's kind of the contents of my, my inside. And David Melech, it's more focused on something external to him. He has, you know, his Torah reading that he does, his Torah study that he does. And he devotes kind of the space and time where even within his chambers, he's always going to be devoted to that. So uh, that's kind of a, a, a second kind of different model a little bit. Um, but we have a third model, which actually might contradict our second one, which is what David Melch himself says in Tehillim, right? He says, uh, In the middle of the night, I get up and I praise you, right? So now we kind of have a little bit of a question. What's, what's his focus? Is he, is he praising Hashem in the middle of the night? Is he learning Torah in the middle of the night? Uh, I mean... You know, I can think of a few answers. Maybe he's doing both, really. Um, maybe his Torah study is a form of his praise. It's, it's one possibility for sure. 
maybe he is actually at immediately at Chatzot, that's when he does his praise. And then he's like, okay, now that I'm up and I did my praise, I sang along to my harp a little bit. I uh, can do my Torah study. Maybe they're two different times. Um, but there's actually uh, an answer that kind of draws all these ideas together. And that's actually where I want to take us right now. So um, the Enaya is uh, Rav Cook's commentary on some of the Agadot in, in the Talmud, right? So there's this book, Ein Yaakov, which is basically a collection of the different Agadot of the Gemara. And the Enaya is a commentary on the Ein Yaakov. So Rav Cook wrote a running commentary on a number, I don't think all, but a number of the, the Masechtot that are um, have their sugyot and agadotot collected in, in, in Yaakov. And so he gives a really actually interesting message here where um, he, kind of, he kind of tries to bring, I think, really a lot of the stuff that we're talking about here together. So he says, David and Melech, since all of his actions during the active portion of the day were only performed for Yisrael, chose to act for himself only at the time meant for rest. Meaning, chatzot, the middle of the night. David and Melech devoted his entire waking hours during the day, at least, when everyone else was awake, he devoted all of that to helping Klal Yisrael somehow, right? Only at the time when everyone else was asleep, when there was nobody who needed his attention, that's when he devoted things to himself. That's when he really focused on his own kind of stuff. And so then Rav Cook doesn't stop there. He delineates for us the three distinctions between the two types of work, between the types of work that he did for Bnei Yisrael and the types of work that he did for himself. As I think will become apparent, part of what he's thinking about for the needs of Yisrael are their physical needs. And part of what he's thinking about for himself are his spiritual needs, right? I'm sure there's a spiritual element to being the king of Israel and I'm sure there's a physical element to his own Torah study and his own kind of work like that. Um, but for the most part, the work that he's doing for, because Rav Cook is commenting on our exact Agatha that I, that I brought above this one here, right? It seems like the needs of Israel are, are highly physically oriented. Whereas the needs that he's doing for himself after Chatzot seem to be more spiritually oriented. And he says, there are three differences between the work that he did for Yisrael and the work that he did for himself. The first is their urgency. Since the needs of Yisrael cannot be put off for even a day. You know, you try to imagine the Yisrael saying, or the sages on their behalf saying, you know, we need food. And David Melech is like, food. Let me think about it. I'll get back to you. I probably wouldn't be so happy with that answer either. <laughs> right? Unlike David's personal work, where no day is like any other, and one expects some bit to like, yeah, he's gonna wake up one night and you know, he's gonna wake up at two in the morning and you know, his internal clock will be two in the morning. It won't be, you know, 8 a.m. for him. And I'll have a little bit of trouble getting into really the Torah learning that he's doing, right? Second is his ability. For in the work he did for the collective, he put all his efforts, he put in all his efforts and his physical strength never stopped him. No matter how exhausted he was, he always made sure to put in that effort. You gotta give 100% for that kind of job. Um, anyone who's watching The Crown, no, it's a 24 hour job. I love that show. Uh, whereas for David, I'm picking back up, his personal work depended on his daily strength, which fluctuates, right? Sometimes he's more uh, alert, sometimes he's less alert, but that was all reserved for, for how he did his own stuff. He never put in less than 100% for B'nai Israel. Finally, and this is, I think, actually really where all of what we're saying so far kind of gets tied together. Finally, the essence of his work for the nation was in his songs and hymns. As he called himself, Naim Zmirot Yisrael, the one who makes pleasant the songs of Yisrael. This is the name that's traditionally applied to David Melech when you're referring to him as the author of Sefer Tehilim. Right, that's when we call David Melech the Naim Zmirot Yisrael. Whereas his Torah study was only for himself. And any Torah study that he did that affected the collective went into his preparation and building of songs for Yisrael, which was his work for the Klal. So you can see in, in this last kind of passage of Rav Kook, the lines are a little bit blurred, right? David Melech's Torah study time is between Chatzot and Alora Shachar. Once Alora Shachar hits, the sages come in, they're like, nation's got to eat, it's time for you to get to work. Before Chatzot, David is asleep, he waits until the, the harp wakes him up in the morning. And then in that time between Chatzot and Alora Shachar, that's when he fully is devoted to his own spiritual development. But as we see, it's not really only his spiritual development, he's devoted to his Torah study, but when his Torah study is relevant to the songs he's going to write, there's a lot of Torah, obviously, in Sefer Tehilim. Any Torah that he learned for that, all of that Torah was really for the cloud. It wasn't for himself, right? Any Torah that he, that he didn't put into his songs, that was the Torah that really was just about him. So I, I, wanna, I wanna just pose the question briefly because I, I think it's actually really kind of interesting and I'm, I'm happy to hear if anybody has kind of like uh, any brief kind of answers. What, well, how are we supposed to interpret this idea that the essence of his work, I'll show it to you in the Hebrew, right? We say in the Hebrew, 
עיקר עבודתו בעד הכלל היו ישירות בתשבחות. The essence of David Amal's work, David Amal, the literal king of Israel, the one who has to give his consent if the nation is going to go to war, the first person who the sages go to if the nation is, is running low on sustenance, the essence of the work that he did for the nation was in his song and his hymns, his shirat, or the tishbacha, right? His, his praise that he wrote, right? Uh, um, if anybody has, has guidance or thoughts at this point, I definitely do want to hear. Well, you know, as, you're, as you are going through these three sources, something that strikes me, and it's, it's, I must be simply wrong, but somehow in Tanakh, is, is there any place in Tanakh that said, and David sat down and studied? Does it even say anywhere in Tanakh that David sat down and wrote? We have the evidence that he did, right? You got, you got the evidence. But in other words, it, Tanakh is about, very frequently about narrative and about lots of other things and, 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 and halacha. But it's almost like the actual act of either prayer and or reflection is absent from the narrative. Now, it may be simply I'm not really intimately familiar with all of the narratives about uh, David HaMelech. But it certainly seems most of the time we see David doing things, reacting to things, and God help us, fleeing because of conflict, right? Or also early on, getting into trouble, like with Bathsheba, etc. So it's like, but it, it, it's the tone of Tanakh is not aimed at what then these commentators, what the Gemara and then Rav Cook aims at. And so I guess it's like, I guess that's what, first of all, why we need them because of the silence. Um, and and we have to feel that David must have had the done done this and had these feelings and had these these things that are kind of absent from the narrative. Anyway, I, I'm just tossing these uh, ideas out as an uh, observation of, because when you put this in front of me, I'm suddenly realizing, hmm, where is it inside? Right. No, totally. I, I yeah, I hear that. I hear that. Um, yeah. Yeah, other, other thoughts before we um, before we start to move on, just right, this idea of David Amelech, the, the king of Israel, Rav Cook seems to hold that the essence of the work that he did for the nation was his his songs and his hymns. Uh, you know, and his thoughts on, on what that could mean, why why that's the most important thing that he, you know, provided beyond his kingship, his, his physical sustenance of Israel. I'll I'll say that I don't exactly relate to it because I wouldn't have thought that, but the only way I can possibly understand it is because it's uh, for, for all of us, for future generations, because it's lasted all this time. Mm. So that's my one understanding. Right, right. We, we still have, we still say separate Tehillim. I mean, Psuki de Zimra is almost exclusively pieces of Tehillim, right? Um, yeah, yeah it's, definitely the thing. it's definitely the way that I most closely interact to things related to David Amelik in my life. Uh, first of all, just to note, this is very timely because we're Peter our Tehillim last year, so it's good that we're hitting on David Amelik and the role of Tehillim. But um, also, just this, this uh, what particularly resonated was I was just recently reading an article. I forget where who wrote it. But I was basically saying like, if you look at Tehillim, it's actually like not the best prayer workbook one could have. It's very repetitive. There's only there's pretty limited themes, but yet the the role it's filled in our, our in our tradition, our religion, is that Tehillim is our go-to when we need to pray for something or are worried about something. And the theory it was articulating, and maybe that's somewhat related, is that part of what's so great about Tehillim is that it's so familiar and predictable and easy sort of to ground yourself in. Because in a moment of crisis, you need something to ground yourself, and Tehillim sort of allows for that. And that, that was just really resonant. Also, I was thinking of one both in terms of Tehillim as a work for the people or for the nation, but also in terms of the Avodah, of Hidden etc., how Tehillim or Tefillah or prayer or certain texts can really work as like a grounding point that then allows us to dive deeper in. Totally. Yeah. I'm, uh, it, it's interesting because also, right, like um, I didn't include this part of the, the Sugi and Brachot, but what happens immediately after David says that they can basically go to war and go plunder. Basically the sages run off in this like massive hurry. They like consult the military advisors and they rally the troops and they're 
going to the Urim and Tumim to see if they're going to be successful. And, you know, there's this immense doubt that starts to like uh, come over them of how they're going to deal with it and what they kind of, all these steps they need to do to ensure their success. Um, but it's interesting, right? This idea of, of Tehillim can be almost this like shelter for us. Um, yeah, I love that. I love that. I would just say there's a, um, di- there's a dichotomy. Great. Between- I'll pose is- one more question to the Klal. If there's... Oh, Oh, sorry, Jeff, did you unmute? I, I don't care. I was just going to say that there was a dichotomy between his Please life say. and his legacy. I mean, his life was nothing, not anything but naim. I mean, he was struggling, 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 but his mirot are naim. And, and that's, I, I can relate to that. Hmm. Nice. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, right. Like, uh, yeah, all of us are definitely at some point or another in that kind of crisis. It is really interesting that he, right, Dafka the Anim Zmirot, right, the Naim Zmirot, that he he does make them pleasant, right? And there's a, in a sense, he makes them safe. Yeah, well, I love that. Um, amazing. No, I, please. I, I just want to say, like, when I meet uh, serious Christians, and I, I tell them I know a bit of Hebrew, very often it strikes me how much they want to hear the 23rd Psalm in, in Hebrew. It's it just, his, it, it, it affected not just Jews, as, uh, but so many non-Jews, the, uh, the book of Tehillim. It's, it's amazing. Certainly, certainly. Um, so good. So here's what I, um, here's where I want to take us now. So I want to get us a little bit into the kind of activity we have for tonight. I know we also did get a little bit of a late start. So if we don't end at eight, it'll be 8.05. I, I won't take us to over very long, I promise. But here's what I've, here's what I've done. Essentially, we see with, um, we see with David that, um, or really we see with David through the lens of Rav Cook also, right? There's this kind of blending between the, the physical and the spiritual, right? That, that even within the physical space that David Melch is in, that's where he finds this kind of spiritual, um, this kind of spiritual space. And even further, we see, right, what is David doing with the Torah that he's taking in for his personal kind of benefit and personal gain? He's writing Sefer Tehillim with us. He's writing basically, like Liad said, the, the book of Tehillim that not only you're up to right now, but that basically every day Klal Yisrael is in to some degree or another, right? And so as, as David is making this time where he's, you know, having this kind of spiritual, you know, depth or reflection or, you know, nourishing his own personal spirituality, it's bleeding into the collective. And suddenly he's writing Sefer Tilim, which, you know, in its own way is also Torah, right? And that Torah is becoming tefillah. And there's this interplay now between the Torah and the tefillah that he's giving, because as he's bringing in to himself Torah, he's creating new tefillot. And these new tefillot are, are coloring the way that also we're seeing Torah. So um, I want to give us the chance tonight to actually not only reflect a little bit on tefillah, but also maybe for those who are, who are willing and able to try to write our own, a little bit of our own Torah. Um, last time we wrote a little bit of tefillah, but tonight a little bit of Torah. Um, normally, no, I have run something like this before, so normally I would do it in person. It would look very differently, but here's what I've gathered for us. I've gathered 20 different quotes about tefillah. They're from a variety of sects, traditions, all that. Um, I'm going to send them in the chat. Actually, maybe after I read this, I'll send them in the chat, and then I'll also um, send the whole PDF so anybody can look at it also. What I want you to do is I want you to just take a chance, kind of go through all of them, and then look through them and try to see three quotes that stick out to you for the following reasons. Try to find one quote that defines for you, uh, roughly, they don't have to be exactly, um, one quote that, that roughly serves as a vision for you for most closely what you want your communal tefillah experience to be like. So that's number one, one that encapsulates your communal tefillah experience. I want you to try to find one that encapsulates your ideal individual tefillah experience. And then I want you to try to find one that most closely encapsulates what you think your tefillah practice might be like right now. So once you find these three quotes, I want us to try to be mefarshim. I want us to try to actually take a second and actually write about them. You can do it kind of however you want. I leave it to you. Some mefarshim wrote, you know, essays. You know, we don't have to write whole essays tonight. We don't have that much time. But some mefarshim wrote, you know, whole kind of sectional quotes, paragraphs basically about the quotes. Some of Farshim wrote in an interlinear way. For those of us who, you know, spend our times in the Gemara, you can see, you know, some sometimes you have one Mafarsh, one type of parish for one 
type of concern, another type of parish for another type of concern. Just write a parish on them. That's what I want to try to do. I'm going to send the quotes now. I'm going to stop sharing and I'll, I'll send them to you. Um, and I want to give us like, basically take us close to eight o'clock, but maybe not all the way there. First of all, I'll do that. I just sent it in the chat and I'll also copy and paste the quotes now. And um, so you have time. So, you know, I want you to read through them once, maybe twice if that's good for you. And then find the ones for you and start writing. It can be anything from a gut reaction to a word for word translation to really whatever uh, commentary to whatever really you like. I'm gonna have to send it in parts. So I sent the PDF, let me get in. Copy. And copy and paste. And copy. That's too long. So good. So I sent those out. Why don't we come back together? Let's take 10 minutes to do it. We'll come back together right at eight o'clock. Could you put the uh, the uh, questions back up, the, the, the three categories? Yeah, I'll also do that. Thank you. For sure. So I just sent those in the chat also. So take some time now, you have about 10, 11 minutes and uh, find the ones that connect to you and uh, let's do a little writing, see what we come up with. Thank <laughs> you. 
So I know I said we would come together around eight. Um, if you all wouldn't mind, uh, you, you, I, I won't necessarily, well, actually, I won't tell you what I'm doing now. If you all wouldn't mind, I'm gonna ask you to send me, if it's easily feasible for you, whatever you have written up on the communal experience of prayer. So that was the first kind of prompt that I gave. So if you wrote something up on a computer, you can send it to me that way. If you, you know, wrote something out, uh, Kind of by pen on a piece of paper and, and it's not easy to send then um you can you, like you can message me kind of a picture of it you can either send it to i guess the odds phone or to mine which i'll just put my number in there and you can just send it to me that way if you want um and yeah that's your phone number down there 617 yeah if the oh, easiest okay. way is to take a picture and send it to me just send it there um, and if you wrote it out in, in text, like in a word document, you can just copy it into your chat and, uh, and send it to me. Or you can also, if you already have Liad's information message into your phone, you can just send it to me there. Uh -huh. Okay. Let's see. How do I do this? How do I send a word document? <laughs> you can just copy and paste. The, oh. the text itself and just send it to me as a private message. I see. Okay. Uh, share. Next week, Jeremy will be hosting an IT class. So anyone who needs help with their computer, it's a copy pasting, you can run through all of it. Okay. Okay. So I don't quite understand how to get it from my computer onto either a phone or, or into a text message. You know, I mean, I can, I can send an email, that's for sure. Sorry to be slow. No, not at all. Um, that's my email. Oh, fantastic. Okay, that'll help. That will help. Yeah, email right. is also great. Everyone just oh, okay, very good. Okay, everyone sorry. just take all my personal information. Sure. That's the easiest way. Sure. Um, and yeah, so so send that send even if you don't know something finished, um, you know, please do send it to me. I would love to see it. And um, what I'm what I'm hoping to do with them actually is uh. I want to put together the different comments that that everybody had about their idea of communal tefillah um, and then actually give that to you all so you all can you know not only benefit from from what you wrote for yourself but also benefit from what you all wrote to each other um, the one thing that you all have in common that i don't is that you pray together so <laughs> hopefully that will um not not be relevant for you not frequently these days <laughs> Okay. 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 Okay.
Okay. Hmm. You can also feel free to send it to me if it's complicated. I'll be helping anybody who wants. But I'm super excited this idea of having a document with our uh, communal vision to be able to see more. It's a very nice idea. In the meantime, I want to invite us back just to, to be together a little bit here. For anybody who's not at their computer or anything like that. And while while people still kind of figure out, you know, how they, if they are going to send uh, something to me so that I can have it to be for uh, all of you. I'd love to hear if people have any reflections on, you know, either what that experience was like or things that came up while you were doing it. Um, I'd love to kind of lose, use our last few minutes to hear you all speak to each other about that and to me. Well, personally, maybe just because of the prompt and because of the learning we did before, pointing out the learning versus prayer to Connie and David and amongst the other divisions, I thought it was very interesting that this, uh, I felt like I was writing a Torah commentary, which I guess for me, maybe more so than other people, is something I feel very familiar with, writing a Dvar Torah, writing a commentary, it's my job. But in the middle, I noticed that it's not because of the nature of tefillah and because of what we're doing, it was like an aspirational commentary. And that like I was interpreting it in the way that I want my prayer to be interpreted, the way I want my prayer to look like. I was taking a little bit of license with these rather short quotes and being like a little bit free with it, which I think is very interesting in that the act of writing a Dvar Torah is itself somewhat of a prayer or somewhat of a, of a kavana or an intent as to a goal or some sort of end. And I really felt that writing this Dvar, this Dvar Torah, this short little thought, I, it meant a lot. Hmm. Yeah, I'm so glad it is, right. It's interesting how, um, this is actually part of what I wrote about in mind, how, uh, you know, part of what we're doing in, in tefillah is meant to spill over a little bit outside of tefillah, right? Uh, if we don't let our tefillah spill outside of our tefillah, then the things that are outside of our tefillah will most definitely spill in. That's that's kind of the way that I've that I've been thinking about it, um, you know. Like the the communal spaces that I love to be in in the most are you know, the the communities where you can feel the tefillah not only in the sanctuary but also in the social hall. Uh, so you know that's that's um, I, I resonate with that, Liad. Other thoughts at all? Anyone? I think mine's more of a journal entry than a Devar Torah, so I'll send it to you because you asked, but it doesn't seem like anything <laughs> I'm proud of, especially. Well, at the very least, I can be proud of it then for you. <laughs> Somebody can be. Um, so I think, I know that there are some people who are still kind of writing it up and figuring out how to send it, but I'll show you, I did get a few kind of submissions so far, so I'll, I'll just share my screen for a second, give you all the chance to kind of look, if not at that, but this is, one person wrote about, a little bit about this, um, say his name, Berdyshevsky, I think that's right. It's uh, this Berdyshevsky quote, right? This idea of God praying, humanity praying, so. Hmm. Let's look down there. We have this one also here from Heschel. Some commentary on it as well. I'll have to make sure that it gets sent out to you also so because um, I want you all really to have it for yourself. Yeah. 
And we also have someone here. I actually really loved this comment. Just communal prayer is extremely difficult, rushed, mumbled, compromised routine. I really do relate to this on such a deep level that, you know, honestly, it's hard enough to pray on my own. How much harder is it to pray with all these other people who are also trying to pray? Um, you know, like you, uh, you imagine a bunch of instruments and, you know, some kind of orchestra or something like that. And it's like, if everything's not perfectly exactly tuned, like it, it comes out feeling all kind of wrong and, you know, it's not the right way. It's very hard to fine tune everybody's tefillah. Rav Dov, who, you know, in a lot of ways is like the kind of underlying this chabura, right? Says that uh, the beautiful Torah that he has, I'm just going to stop the share for a second. A beautiful kind of Torah that he shares is this idea that lechaven, the word lechaven, right? Meaning from kavana, um, is not only, the only meaning of it is not to intend in a musical context, the meaning of lechaven is to tune. Uh -huh. So you tune an instrument that would be lechaven at the right? So really for all of us, um, you know, we find ourselves here as Kalim and Tefillah, really trying to be Mechaven ourselves. Really, we're just making sure that we're tuned exactly right so that the note that comes out, it's not, it's not too high, it's not too low, too flat, too sharp. It's exactly how we want it to come out. Um, somebody sent me another, which is um, also really nice, actually. Let me just share. One more time. Great. So some people are saying it would be easiest for them to send at a different point. I think that's totally fair. I understand some of our internal clocks we said already were inching toward the later part of the night. <laughs> and um, and I, di I did pass the one hour mark. So once I pass the one hour mark, it's totally, I understand it's fair game. We got to stop. Um, so, so with that, um, I, I thank you all again for your time, for, for having this little moment of tequila together. And yeah, um, as you have more of these, again, you know, Liad has my information. Um, if you pass these kind of quotes that you've written onto Liad once they're transcribed, um, I'll get them into this document. And then hopefully we'll enrich your tefillah, not only to have your own kind of commentaries, your own Torah turning into tefillah, but also to see in your